Good afternoon. We shall begin our discussion. This third panel, as you can see, is devoted to peace education towards sustainable development. There will be three presentations. First of all, a presentation by Mrs. Priscilla Ankut, Executive Vice Chairman of the Kaduna State Peace Commission in Nigeria, and the Ambassador of Tunisia, Mr. Ghazi Gerari. But first of all, we shall listen to the message of Venerable Master Ching Kung. And I would invite you subsequently to discuss among yourselves, because what's important to me is not so much the speeches, but uh, rather the subsequent discussions. So before beginning, I'd like to ask the Secretary General of the Association of Master Jin Kung's friends to give us a short introduction. Please go ahead. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Mm, thank you, Chair, and I'm sorry about this delayed start to our panel. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Master Ching Kong always tells the ambassadors who visit him that education is critical and it is uh, the basis for any work for peace in the world in order to ensure a harmonious and prosperous future for future generations. We all know that uh, UNESCO is the world leader in education. And in UNESCO's education programs, there is a section on peace education. And through the voice of the United Nations, we talk about sustainable development for the sustainable development goals. And the panel to follow brings forth these two pressing issues facing today's world. In other words, peace education vis-à-vis -vis sustainable development. And this panel will endeavor to enlighten us and provide food for thought regarding the interaction and, inter and interdependence between these two major issues, peace education on the one hand and sustainable development on the other. So we now take great pleasure in giving the floor to this panel's moderator, who, as we all know, is once again going to make this panel a resounding success at this conference. Thank you again. Thank you, Secretary General. And to uh, foster the subsequent discussions, we shall begin, first of all, by listening to the message of peace of Venerable Master Kung. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank everyone for organizing this conference, Amitofu. And next is the start of our panel. So 
and a message from Master Chen Kung. Chinkung 和爱的教育如何化解矛盾冲突从政而物自民心就会造成无穷无尽的灾难使其永远保持并发扬光大《说文解字》中指出即是通过教育三种普世教育的问题
朋友啊，这些关系不是人为规定的，而是自然形成的啊。如何处理这五种关系？第一，父子有亲，啊，父母慈爱儿女，儿女孝顺父母，其核心精神是一体的孝的观念，啊，孝是道德之源。第二，啊，长幼有序，啊，依照长幼顺序。互相敬爱关怀，从兄弟姐妹之友爱，拓展为尊重一切年长者，爱护一切年幼者，啊，尊师重道是其代表，啊，其核心的精神为敬。孝亲尊师是一切德行的大根大本。第三，夫妇有别，别是是角色任务不同。丈夫在外维持生计，妻子在家相夫教子。印光大师指出。归捆乃圣贤所出之地，母教为天下太平之源。家庭教育特重母教，中国古人高度重视初始教育，如胎教、幼教和启蒙教育。保护幼童不受负面信息的污染，初始教育根基稳固，人就具备辨别是非、邪正、善恶的能力，而不会沦为无知。当今一切社会冲突的根源。在哪里呢？在家庭，夫妻冲突引发父子冲突、兄弟冲突，进而升级为社会冲突。第四，君臣有义，领导以仁德对待下属。下属以忠诚对待领导，啊，双方秉持道义精神，啊，社会团体内部就能稳定和谐。第五，朋友有信，朋友相处要讲求信用，能够推行五轮大道。构建人类命运共同体的构想啊，就有了坚实的社会基础。啊，五轮是道，啊，是自然规律。道德教育啊，随顺自然规律而行。把伦理关系处理的非常和谐融洽，就是德。中国古人将其总结为五常，内容为：第一，仁，就是爱人，啊，推己及人，己所不欲，勿施于人。第二义，就是循理，一切生与义的造作，都要合情、合理、合法。第三礼，啊，是礼节、规矩，啊
，凡是有节度，啊，有节制，啊，没有理社会秩序，就会混乱。第四治，啊，凡事要用理智，不能用感情。第五信。相信人本性本善，对人要守信用。五常进一步展开啊，还有孝悌忠信、礼义廉耻、仁爱和平啊等具体的德行德目。人能自我修养五常之德啊，并秉持。仁义礼智信的精神，对待家人，家庭就会整齐有序。每个家庭都能整齐，国家自然安置。各个国家都能安置，则世界自然和平。接下来，因果教育。大乘佛教常说：“万法皆空，因果不空。”因果规律是一种具有普遍性的客观规律。《道德经》指出：“天网恢恢，疏而不失。”因果规律就像一张布满宇宙的天罗地网，贯穿于万事万物之中。其主要内容和总的原则，即是善有善报，恶有恶报。伦理道德教育使人羞于作恶。因果教育使人不敢造恶，因果教育对扭转和改良世风的效果更为显著。清朝安世高，啊，清朝周安世先生指出，啊，人人之因果，天下大治之道也。人人不知因果，天下大乱之道也。逐渐因果观念，对于规范世道人心、维护世界安定，有着不可替代的作用。接受这三种教育的人，会安分守己，不怨天，不由人。积极进取，崇德向善，以伦理道德因果教育促进社会和谐。我们有真实案例可做证明。二零零五年至二零零六年，我们在家乡中国安徽省庐江县汤池镇成立。庐江文化教育中心采用中华传统儒释道三教的基本教材，以言传身教的方式，教育全镇四万八千居民。啊，结果在短短三个月内，大众的良知良人被唤醒，都感到羞于作恶。汤池镇的社会风气大大改善，啊，犯罪率、离婚率大幅下降，家庭变得和谐，邻里变得和睦，小孩变得孝顺，街道变得整齐，治安变得良好，教育效果非常显著。这充分证明了人性本善，以及人是教的好的。另外，我们还在新加坡
和澳洲图恩巴，致力于宗教团结与族群团结工作，啊，促进多元文化、多元宗教和谐共处。同样取得了显著成效，这些成果都曾在联合国教科文组织总部进行过报告，感动了与会的大使代表们。这些案例都能证明圣贤教育对促进社会和谐的巨大作用。我们观察世界各大宗教的教义，可以发现，重视伦理道德、因果教育是各宗教的显著共性，充分证明了这是人类主要的教育。人而无德，行之不远。在当今世界。能否提升全球人民伦理道德素养，实为决定人类未来走向的当务之急。其中最为重要的、最为有效的方法，无过于宗教团结、宗教回归教育、宗教互相学习。应该从哪里做起呢？啊，要从自己做起，啊，从我一家、我的社区、我所属的宗教做起。我们要培养宗教人才，把每个宗教经典中有关伦理、道德、因果教育的内容。通过网际网路向全球进行讲解播放，也可以以地区为单位，建立道德讲堂和多元文化教育活动中心，让这一地区的人民增进交流，共同接受圣贤教育。从历史和现实出发，可知，唯有东西方全面恢复圣贤教育，人类生活才能获得尊严，获得意义，获得价值，构建持久和平、共同繁荣的和谐世界的美好愿景，才能实现。让我们一起携手努力，通过神圣的教育，缔造一个互敬互爱、共存共荣的人类命运共同体。最后，祝福与会的各国大使啊，嘉宾们。平安喜乐，如意吉祥。世界各国风调雨顺，国泰民安，世界大同，永续和平。啊，谢谢大家。Merci. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen. There is a wonderful message from Venerable Master Chin Kung. And I would uh, invite you to become familiar with this very important work on the principles of Master Chin Kung. It's uh, beautifully written, it's easy to understand with the noble principles on governance, education, morality, ethics, and plenty else. And I would advise you, therefore, to read 
that work. So we shall now hear from our second speaker on uh, sustainable development and uh, governance, and I'd like to invite Mrs. Priscilla Ankut, who is the Executive Vice Chair of the Kaduna State Peace Commission of Nigeria, to take the floor. Excellency, the moderator of this panel, your excellencies, um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is an honor and privilege to speak to this esteemed gathering after taking the very important and humbling message from the Venerable Master Chinkong. I have been invited to share my perspective on what we do in Kaduna State, northwestern Nigeria, and how we are trying to sustain peace and development through interreligious and intercultural dialogues. So what I will be doing in the next 20 minutes is to share with you some of our experiences and our lessons and some of them resonate with what we talked about this morning. Efforts from Tunisia, Morocco, Egypt, all of them resonate all over the world. So the outline of my presentation is in three parts. The first part will try to give you a brief background and context of Kaduna State, especially where this is situated in the global village and why the experiences that we have gathered are important for lesson learning. The second part of my, concent of my presentation focuses on interreligious and intercultural dialogues in promoting sustainable peace in Kaduna State. I will spend a few minutes reflecting about the challenges of interreligious and intercultural dialogues and how this is impacting on our efforts towards sustaining peace. And then I will share a little bit of lessons that we have learned over time and how to strategically link our peaceful messaging, peaceful education to the sustainable development goals as we talk about them. And I start with a few uh, questions as to why interreligious and intercultural dialogue matter for sustainable peace and development. Why are we talking about that? Why does it matter? The first reason in my mind is that many people in the global south have more trust in religious institutions than in government institutions. I am sure it's the same in my country as it is in many other countries. There is simply more faith in religious institutions and that is why going back to the teachings of religion is so crucial to world peace. The second reason is that religious and traditional actors can contribute to reducing tensions in communities through messages of peace, messages of love and tolerance, which enable more trust and safe zones for addressing other development challenges. Sometimes when you talk about peaceful coexistence and harmony, the people that you confront with daily also want to talk about other development challenges. What is our social economic development looking like uh, when we talk about peace? The third reason why I think it is important to talk about this is because religious and traditional actors can help to translate sustainable development goals into quasi-religious narratives, thereby mobilizing the broader support and motivation of people from religious and traditional communities. When the message comes from religious actors or traditional rulers, because these are traditionally considered as trusted and safe spaces, we're able to mobilize a broader support and people are able to participate. The fourth reason is that the world itself is deeply affected by religious identities and meanings. We are all seated in this room from different backgrounds and religions. And one of the things that I believe strongly is that a peace process 
that is based solely on secular values will probably not be sustainable. Emerging evidence suggests that reconciliation must involve both religious and traditional actors. And mostly for those of us that are practitioners on the field, we work with communities that have been affected by histories of violence, communities that have suffered pain and injury as a result of anger, as a result of lack of tolerance. And when you want to pass on the message of religion and forgiveness, it is important that this message is channeled through religious education because people understand that a bit better than anything else. Interreligious and intercultural dialogues provide us with useful tools for building awareness among majority of communities about the experiences and needs of minorities. These dialogues, if carefully managed, have the capacity to bring simmering tensions to the surface and address them in potentially constructive manner. Now, Kaduna State, as I said, it's a, it's a state that is located in the northwest of Nigeria. The population of this state is about 8 million people, and in terms of its strategic importance, it is the third most populous state in Nigeria. For those of you who know a little bit about Nigeria, the bigger states will be places like Lagos and Kanu, and Kaduna comes third. Strategically, it is very important to Nigeria because in Kaduna you find a diversity of people. There's no ethnic religious group in Nigeria that is not based in Kaduna. So Kaduna in itself has about 60 different ethnic groups. There are different religions, predominantly Muslim and Christian, but also we have people who practice traditional ways of worshiping. Kaduna has had a history of violent conflicts, and these conflicts have been driven by multi-dimensional factors, and one of them, and that constantly reoccurs, is religion. Kaduna experiences very deep ethno-religious and political differences. And this has led to the circles of violence that we've seen. Between 1980 and the year 2019, Kaduna State has recorded not less than 35 episodes of intercommunal, interreligious crises, which have unfortunately resulted in the loss of many lives and seen the destruction of properties worth millions of dollars. The government and the people of Kaduna State have tried repeatedly to stem the tide of violence and see how they can resolve these issues. It hasn't worked, or perhaps it has worked with limited success. And so very recently, the government of Kaduna State took the initiative to establish a landmark registration which established the Kaduna State Peace Commission, the organization which I work for, and the organization in whose capacity I am here today. The Kaduna State Peace Commission was established basically to promote mutual trust, respect for human rights, harmonious and peaceful coexistence in the state. It has been working, and in about three years of its existence, the commission has been able to record some success stories which I will share with you right away. Now, some of the success stories that I'm happy to share are that using an intercommunal dialogue process, the Commission has been able to facilitate peace agreements through addressing structural drivers of conflict. The dialogue process in itself, which brings together different groups, particularly the religious, traditional, cultural, ethnic groups, seeks to address, because I said earlier that the conflict itself appears to be intractable, about a 35-year history of conflict in the state. Now, how do we manage this using the dialogue process? We try as much as possible to see that within the structure of the dialogue process, we talk about the structural drivers of conflict. And that presents us with an entry point that people can relate to, people can engage with. We have also used interreligious dialogue 
and use religious sermons to foster peaceful elections in Kaduna State. And this is even taking it to the political dimension. Nigeria had an election in 2019, early this year. And for anyone who was observing happenings in Nigeria, there was a great threat. And because Nigeria also has a unique history of uh, violence and election, there was a threat that there could be uh, an escalation into violence if the situation was not managed. And how, what did we do? We worked through our religious leaders. In Kaduna, we gathered religious leaders from different faith groups, the Christian faith, the Muslim faith, and engage them in ways to foster peace through infusing their messages with peace. The sermons in the churches, the khutbahs in the mosque, I remember particularly on the eve of the governorship elections in Kaduna State, we had to run from one mosque to the other and one church to the other, simply encouraging preachers to preach peace before the elections. The reason is because the tension was palpable at the time. There were two dominant political parties that were contesting the elections. And for some reason, the perception was that one of the dominant political parties aligned closely to the Christian faith, and the other one aligned closely to the Muslim faith. And this divided the communities, the society, in ways that were quite unprecedented. Understandably, this was worrying for us. And I will say confidently that without the role of interreligious dialogue in those elections, perhaps we would be reporting differently. But to say that the elections were relatively peaceful in Kaduna State, and this peace was enjoyed because our religious leaders rose to the occasion and spoke to the issues, passing messages of love, passing messages of trust, passing messages of respect. We continue to engage in dialogues. There are communities that have experienced uh, very, uh, you know, prolonged periods of violence and that we're using our religious leaders and traditional leaders to be able to bridge the gap and make sure that Kaduna is on the path of peaceful and harmonious coexistence. But we experience challenges. It's not always easy. The first challenge that I want to talk about this afternoon is a challenge of competing narratives in the communities. Religion, as I've said earlier, has become a very major driver of conflict, unfortunately. There are some groups who see religion as a retrogressive system that reinforces abuse and preaches hate. And that is why terrorism is being experienced, if you look at the Boko Haram in Nigeria. And there are a group of people who strongly believe in this narrative, wrongly or rightly. But there's also another group which believes that religion is an instrument of peace and a moral voice. And many of us in this room belong to that group. But in pushing forward this message, you are confronted with a community that is divided by these conflicting narratives. And therefore, you need to build a critical mass of people who believe more that the religion is an instrument of peace. And that is why the message we just listened to for me is very, very uh, key, which is a message that I am determined to take back to my society, to Kaduna State, so that we continue reinforcing the force of love, the force of peace, the force of forgiveness towards harmonious coexistence. The second challenge that I experience as a practitioner working from one community to the other is a challenge of helping people to overcome mutual suspicion and mistrust in communities, owing from the legacy of violence that has been experienced. Like I said, if you look at the history of violence, and if I had more time to talk about it, I would show you, you know, case by case which of the crises was seen to be driven along religious lines. So the legacy of violence remains in our communities, and people need to continue to be convinced that there is an alternative way to live in, and that the narratives of hate will not take us very far. The third challenge is how do we sustain peace beyond peace agreements? Sometimes, for those of us who work for peace, the easier part it's actually always when you get parties around the table, 
you make sure you have all the stakeholders that are key, whether they're traditional institutions or they are Christian leaders, and they get to agree that they will live in peace. But beyond the agreement, how do you sustain peace, especially if the peace remains fragile, that it can be threatened at the slightest provocation? And in our experience, such slight provocations sometimes have to, be with the have to do with the misinterpretation of religious texts, and it can lead to a whole new dimension of crisis. So how do we make sure that we sustain these peace agreements in a way that allows us to foster sustainable development? There is a common agreement and a consensus among all that there cannot be development. There cannot be development, either social, economic development, political development, whatever way you want to look at it. It simply cannot be in the absence of peace. So there comes the linkage between sustainable development and fostering enduring peace. Some of the lessons that we have learned, as I've shared, is that interreligious and intercultural dialogues can successfully respond to sustainable development goal issues. How can that happen? The case study that I've shared from Kaduna reveals that interreligious and intercultural dialogue can have a positive effect on addressing sustainable development issues. The use of dialogue platforms for conflict prevention and peace building, which focus on addressing drivers of conflicts, can help to foster inclusivity and ensure active citizens' participation in government. Examples of issues that we have dealt with as such platforms include the promotion of social welfare, the promotion of health, education, how to get communities to understand that certain resources like land and water are shared, and how they can reach agreement on using those shared resources. We have also used our platform to address issues of climate change. Uh, very recently, because uh, of the history of you know, division in the state, uh, we find that the state is polarized along different religious groups. So what do we do? We use the theme of climate change and environment to bring actors together. We went to a community that is far in the north of Kaduna State, which is predominantly occupied by Muslims, and asked youths, to move over to the south of Kaduna, which is uh, predominantly occupied by Christians, to clean the streets and vice versa, and also to plant trees. And in doing that, we ask them to commit to the responsibility of saying, if I have planted, I live in the north of Kaduna and I've gone over to the south to plant a tree, I owe it as an obligation to water this tree, to nurture it, and to make sure it lives. So using those kind of themes, we have been able to find very good entry points that link us strategically into the sustainable development goals. The second lesson that we've learned is that while we continue to talk about sustainable development goals, or sustainable development and peace building, we find out that there are certain topics that are easier to be addressed by interreligious and intercultural dialogues than others. If you talk about the issue around energy, sustainable production and consumption, life underwater, all these are sustainable development goals, you find that they are a little bit more difficult to, to address using interfaith and intercultural dialogues. However, when you talk about issues of poverty, you talk about issues of hunger, health, Education, gender equality, and in particular, peace, justice, and strong institutions, you find that you are able to effectively address this through interreligious and intercultural dialogues. So these are some of the lessons that we've learned. The last lesson, but not the least, is the possibility for measuring the impact of interreligious and intercultural dialogues. When we talk about, you know, we all speak very well about, you know, the, the, the good results of interreligious and intercultural dialogues. But when you want to take that a bit further and think about how are we measuring this impact, one of the things we've learned is that we can actually begin to develop a literature on monitoring impact if we align this conversation 
with the conversation on sustainable development goals because here you already have a framework with targets and indicators that could be helpful in improving and focusing our evaluations according to, you know, an acknowledged framework. And when we're able to build a body of evidence to show how this is working positively, then you are able to sustain the conversation using peace building as a tool for fostering development. These are some of the lessons that we have learned from Kaduna. I am mindful that I was asked to speak for 20 minutes. Your Excellency, I hope I haven't exceeded that time. Uh, but let me begin to wrap up my conversation by saying a big thank you to all of you for your kind attention this afternoon. It's not always easy to stay alert and attentive, especially after you've had a very good lunch. Uh, but I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to questions that uh, would enable me to throw more light and experience and examples on the work that we're doing in Kaduna State. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam, for this uh, intervention about your experience in Kaduna State. And I am sure that there are many questions, especially uh, among those people that they know the experience of Toowoomba in Australia, maybe the link between the two experiences it will be very useful. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I shall now the floor to my friend, His Excellency Ambassador Ghazi Gherari, a permanent delegate of Tunisia, who plays a very active role in this organization, especially, especially in um, uh, the area of dialogue and heritage, uh, and intangible heritage. So it's a great pleasure to have you with us among us this afternoon. Ambassador, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator, for your kind words. And I would like to begin by expressing my thanks to the organizers, and particularly the association of Master Jinkung's friends, in order to allow us to meet again. And I had the great honor and pleasure in speaking from the same podium last year at the same conference on peace and the focus of the discussions then was the nexus between harmony, education and ethics and the opportunity afforded me by the organizers this afternoon is to some extent to continue that line of thought uh, before you and I hope with you. Now, dealing with the link between peace, education, and sustainable development may um, be done in several ways, and indeed it has been approached in several different ways. The two speakers who spoke so well before me uh, have each shed light on this issue with a reflection based on ethics and the extremely poignant message conveyed to us earlier by the Venerable Master, and then on the other hand, practical experience on the ground with uh, one of the most uh, uh, rewarding examples that we've just heard about. Now, my uh, contribution will take neither of those two paths. With your permission, I will discuss with you, or at least present to you, a coherent, viable um, structuring or dovetailing of these uh, three concepts, peace, um, education, and sustainable development. One may be tempted to take some historical shortcuts. First of all, this building, this house, was uh, emerged from the aftermath of aftermath after the Second World War, and it wasn't thinking of sustainable development at the time, because it's uh, uh, established practice here to quote the first sentence in the Constitution of UNESCO and say that its mission is to construct the defenses of peace in the minds of men and women through UNESCO's tools, education, science, and culture. And thus, we think that historically, this uh, whole house was uh, built on those twin prongs of education and peace, which is true, but it may not be terribly precise. 
But if you, if you go back to UNESCO's constitution and read it in detail, you'll find elements which well before 2015 and the creation of the concept of sustainable development by the UN, I think we can detect that this idea was already present. Now, what idea are we talking about? Uh, the idea that the, the twin prongs of education and peace may not suffice. And I'm going to read to you an extract from our Constitution, uh, which um, says that peace based only on economic, political, and governmental agreements uh, cannot bring about the lasting and sincere the uh, commitment of peoples, and therefore this peace needs to be established on the foundation of intellectual and moral solidarity of humanity, and I think the founding fathers and the drafters of this constitution were aware that economic and peace were linked. And I'll try in due course to look at how at that indirect interaction with you and perhaps during the debate. But the founders of this organization understood that le the legal and political writing of this um, constitution was not enough and you could have economic, political um, and other agreements, but it may not be sufficient because uh, the reference is to additional uh, harmony, that is, the ethical values of humanity. And in 2015, when the United Nations established the concept of sustainable development with the goals which uh, we uh, hope to achieve between now and 2030, it actually tangibly puts into um, text or into, into reality what was in the text of the Founding Fathers. Now, when we talk about uh, peace, we're in a UN specialized agency, and we're talking about all the values, attitudes, behaviors, and, and ways of life which reject violence and prevent conflict by attacking uh, conflict at the roots through uh, dialogue and negotiation among groups and uh, states. And that's so much for peace. But when we talk about education, we talk about all the ways and means which will um, train the minds of the young and less young and develop knowledge so that one develops a social awareness of the surrounding world, but also awareness of the state of scientific knowledge reached at that point in time. So obviously without that awareness or realization, there cannot be construction of peace. You can't establish peace on the basis of ignorance of knowledge uh, and above all ignorance of each other and ignorance of one's uh, neighbor. So. Uh, uh, knowledge alone uh, is not enough to have peaceful ties between um, the members of society, between groups, and between states for international relations. So in September 2015, when this third concept of sustainable development came along, this was uh, a request for sophistication, so to speak, for, for um, some more precise detail on this nexus between uh, peace and education, because sustainable development is a comprehensive approach to these aspects. We can't achieve peace or uh, have education for peace without uh, having these constituent components of sustainable development. The 17 sustainable development goals, the S S SDGs adopted by the 193 member states of the UN in September. September 2015 are thus part and parcel of the construction of peace because development and peace are interdependent and uh, are in synergy um, with each other. And indeed, our organization's director general said at the time that there can be no sustainable development without peace, nor peace without sustainable development. So how do you get these three concepts to dovetail, as I suggested? Well, first of all, in this outline, I think it's important for the three concepts to be interlinked. 
And you can't talk about peace without education, without knowledge, and without knowledge of, other, of others. But there can be no stable relationship and uh, lasting uh, relationship, as the UNESCO Constitution says, without peace and development, uh, providing some guarantees. Now, what are the new elements? vis-à-vis -vis -vis the state of knowledge and uh, the normative work of the UN agencies. Well, first of all, this education cannot be any old education. It has to be quality education, it has to be egalitarian education in terms of access, but also egalitarian through its content. One cannot build a harmonious, peaceful society if the content of curricula uh, doesn't allow for knowledge of, of others and their rights, and especially their fundamental rights. So we're talking about if, uh, edifying uh, education with a certain type of content. And as of 2015, there was also a realization that this education and this link between peace and education cannot be confined to curricula. You need a, a setting, an environment conducive to this, and the awareness of that environment uh, is now crystal clear. Why? Because the question of education and the relationship with peace uh, depend on many elements, many factors. For example, equality within a society, equality among individuals, equality uh, in terms of gender and religion, and equality among the various social classes in society. So each uh, society needs to be organized in such a way that you guarantee access to quality, egalitarian education, the content of which needs to be compatible with respect for others. You could call it human rights in a society, but also international uh, rights and respect between nations. And I think the key element which is added to this is environmental awareness which was not uh, present when UNESCO was founded through that constitution, because we've understood that uh, economic development and social development in our communities could generate a measure of harmony, but this harmony uh, and development may be in contradiction with the ev evolution of those societies. Now, what do, we, do I mean by contradiction? I mean that this evolution doesn't guarantee the rights of future generations. And that is how we came to the triangulation I referred to at the start, this dovetailing between these three concepts. What is the use of education allowing for a certain measure of peace in society if those who live in that society today do not hand on uh, this to future generations? in the best possible conditions. What is the responsibility of those today in handing down to future generations a planet where the environment is in jeopardy, or when water is getting more scarce, or when the quality of health is a variable depending on one region to another? And I could go through all the 17 uh, sustainable development goals in this light. So this uh, realization, I think, adds to the relationship between peace and development, an element which I would simply call responsibility. We are and must be responsible in strike, trying to strike this balance between education and peace, while also looking ahead towards future generations. This is a critical element which uh, contributes to international awareness raising. But we know that international relations, international law, agreements, and treaties concluded to this end are not at the best possible level today without wishing to single out any country or specific agreement, but you all know what I'm referring to. So today we have a responsibility 
to build societies which will generate uh, uh, educational systems which, res which uh, foster respect for each other and uh, guarantee education for the largest possible number of people with equal access, but this process of education and guaranteeing peace must be respectful of our environment and of the planet, which we are going to bequeath to future generations. This triangulation, as I call it, I think is at the heart of today's reflection. And I don't think we can talk about peace, that is, absence of violence, immediate violence between individuals, groups or states if we inflict violence on future generations by bequeathing to them a planet where life itself is in jeopardy and when the sources of life are more scarce and when the atmosphere is completely polluted. So I think this is a crucial factor in this new balance and to my mind I hope that I've opened your eyes to this relationship between these three these three concepts. I think it's a living process. It's feasible, I think, but above all, this relationship should be should mean something to you, and you can't take it in just one direction education leading to peace and peace to sustainable development, you can take it in the other direction. If we do not guarantee sustainable development, education will be jeopardized and ultimately peace would be threatened. Without going to the extremes of alarmism, but um, those who talk of, of uh, future conflicts uh, related to massive uh, climate disruption and the disruption of humanity's access to the sources of life, which are the cr critical elements in nature. So I think that these are critical aspects which must be taken into account. And I hope more than taking them into account, I hope you will uh, undergo a, an awakening, uh, a realization. I think we're particularly important here because UNESCO and the UN system is deemed to be the place where uh, conscience and awareness uh, are challenged. So before you, I've tried to challenge this system, and uh, that was what was suggested to me by the organizers of this conference. And I think that uh, would honor our conference and the reflection at it if we uh, deal with these three elements equally openly, fundamental elements without which we cannot truly talk about lasting peace, we cannot talk about equality, and we can't even talk about human rights as it happens. So I hope this uh, linking of the three elements will generate an, an exchange of views among you, and I'd be very happy to provide some enlightenment, perhaps, or at the very least, answers to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your wonderful presentation. And thank you for mentioning the founding document of UNESCO. I am sure, ladies and gentlemen, that you sh must have a lot of questions. But we are starting to eat away at the time scheduled for the next panel. However, we will still take the time to take two or three quick questions before we move on to the fourth panel of this conference. So are there any questions? Perhaps this means that our presenters were extremely clear and articulate. Okay, so I would like to thank all of you for your participation, for being here, and now I would like to invite the Ambassador of Togo, my friend, Mr. Sambini, to come here and to serve as the moderator of the fourth panel so that we can continue discussing this theme. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, you have the floor. <laughs> 